Good morning. It's 10 o'clock on Friday morning or a little after 10 o'clock on Friday morning. That means it's time for the Real Estate Fix. I'm your host, Rich Sherman, and this morning we're going to be going over all kinds of good stuff. But before we do, let's get into my disclaimer a little bit, because I have to read this every week. I am not an attorney, and I do not give legal advice. I hold a California real estate license, and I have over 30 years of experience. The opinions I express and the advice I give is strictly my own. I would encourage anyone who has real estate issues uh, to also check with the relevant experts, like attorneys, accountants, etc. And again, if you need any of those experts, I am happy to refer them to you. You can call me at 661-714-1400. That is my personal cell phone number. So if you have any questions about uh, me or you need a referral or something like that, please call. We're happy to help you out. But this week, we got a fun show this week. It's going to be good, especially after reading that disclaimer. I think you guys will get a kick out of it because I actually brought an attorney this week, um, I, the one I live with. Uh, I, <laughs> I was asked... Uh, by listeners and, and management alike to please bring Jane back, Jane uh, Sherman, my wife, and super-duper real estate attorney, fantastic real estate attorney. I am biased, but she is amazing uh, because, uh, well, she's smarter and better looking than I am, so that's fair. So we're going to have her on today. We're going to talk about all sorts of stuff having to do with rent landlords and tenants because I think a lot of people have no idea what the laws currently are governing landlord-tenant relationships, and in a lot of cases... Uh, you know, I say this all the time. Most government intervention, in my view, are good ideas badly implemented. And, oh boy, we got a lot of that to talk about today. So it's going to be a lot of fun. But first, we're going to do a market update. We're going to take a look at the national market, real estate market. We're going to take a look at the California market. Uh, and then, yeah, we're Jane's going to be on. We're going to talk about landlord restrictions and all kinds of fun stuff. So this is The Real Estate Fix. I'm your host, Rich Sherman, on KHTS 98.1 FM and AM 1220. Uh, if you have any questions for me, you can always call on the show, 661-298-KHTS, that's 661-298-5487, or, uh, which nobody seems to ever want to call it, <laughs> but uh, maybe the age we live in. But if you want to email me, which is where we get most of our, our questions, get a lot of questions through the email, it's thefixwithrich at gmail.com, no spaces. Again, it's the fix with rich at gmail.com and any questions you have real estate related or frankly otherwise we've got if you had one about a plumber earlier this week which is nice um happy to help i gave him a referral for a plumber we have a couple of good local plumbers we recommended them but let's talk about the market let's go into some of the market stuff it's always what we like to see what's going on not a huge change in the market from last week to this week uh but the real estate market is well it's where you'd expect it to be um and i will say before i get into this too much those of you who, who know me and who've worked with me and who kind of heed my advice on this topic, one of the reasons I have a radio show now, uh, I'm not always right, but I'm right a lot more than anyone else you know. And it's just a matter of reading these reports and kind of you know paying attention to which way the wind is blowing. So let's talk about the national real estate market. Nationally, according to, Los Al according to Altos Research, Venerable firm, one you guys should be reading if you're into this, or you can listen to me because I read it. Altos Research, out of, as of April 17th, there were only 66,000 new listings of single-family homes nationwide. That means in a country of 360 million people, roughly, there were only 66,000 listings. Of those, 25% of which went under contract within the first 30 days. Now, that doesn't sound too, too bad, except when you compare it to last year's number, during the same time period, there were over 100,000 new listings, and over 30% of those went under contract almost immediately. So that's a heck of a drop. That's a 33% drop in the number of listings, and of those listings, only they're not selling as quickly. So houses are taking longer to sell, and there are fewer from on the market, uh, which is strange, because usually when supply and demand dictates, if supply remains constant, excuse me, if demand remains constant and supply is retarded, then usually uh, prices go up. And that's not the case here because we have a high interest rate and demand has dropped off as housing has dropped off, as housing availability has dropped off. So it's, it's bad on both fronts. But anyway, uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. I want to get into a little bit why people are not putting their houses on the market at the moment. And again, like everything else in real estate, it's all interest rate and consumer confidence driven. Uh, a growing number of homeowners have basically decided against listing their homes for sale that otherwise would. I, my wife and I fall into this category. Uh, the reason for that is because they have extremely low interest rates. According to Fannie Mae, 70% of all homes in the United States, 70% single-family homes, have an interest rate right now be below 4.5%. And when you consider the going interest rate right now is 6.5%, and it's going to be seven here pretty quickly. We'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, why would you go from a 4.5% interest rate to a 6.5% or higher interest rate unless you were awfully motivated to do so? So you have a lot of people who are keeping houses and renting them, or they're just staying in their house. I mean, in my case, I have an interest rate under 4%. I'm not going to chuck that interest rate and move into a more expensive house. My payment right now is very low. Were I to buy my house 
my payment would be much, much higher, It'd be about 30 to 40 percent higher, just because of the difference in the interest rate. So if I were to buy a bigger, better, nicer house, which would presumably cost more money, my, my uh, payment would be through the ceiling. And that's what it is for a lot of people. So unfortunately, lots and lots of people out there are choosing not to sell that otherwise would, and that is keeping inventories down. Interest rates being as high as they are is what are keeping a lot of buyers out of the market. Not all, uh, but quite a lot. Let's get into this a little bit. The inventory numbers, uh, traditionally, just to give you some how it usually works, inventory numbers in real estate usually climb nationally for the 20 weeks beginning in mid-February and running through June. So really the first half of the year is when houses tend to come on the markets where you see escalating numbers constantly. We're halfway through that cycle and inventory is still falling. And if that is not a huge indicator, I don't know what else would. Housing prices are going to fall. We're in this nice little uh, bubble right now. Uh, and I'll get to that in a second where housing has taken a little uptick. But overall, they're still going to slide about 5% by the end of this year. I said in April of last year they're going to dive 10%. That's exactly what they've done. As of today, we're about 10% off that mark. Some high areas are a little bit higher, 11 or 12. Some areas are a little bit lower, 8 or 9. But overall, we've lost 10% of our value. So you have an $800,000 house in April of last year. You now have a $720,000 house. And that's just the reality of it. Um, so yeah, so inventory levels are still falling. Nationally, the same group, Altos Research, says at least 29.8% of active homes on the market have taken price cuts uh, during the week of April 17th, which is when they're, uh, which is two weeks ago, that was when they did their survey. So in that week, almost 30% of every house on the market dropped their price. Now that happens, it's people drop prices to sell houses all the time, usually not in a strong market because that's a high number, but there were 40% fewer of those at the same week last year. So April 17th of the week of mid-April, second week, third week in April last year, there were 40% fewer people who dropped the prices on their houses. So not a lot of inventory, prices are dropping, interest rates going up, it is not good. That is the national look. Let's talk about California, a little, a little more local for us. Uh, in California, according to First Tuesday, which is a great uh, website, if you guys have not read it, they put out a, a, a newsletter that is fantastic. I encourage everybody to read it. Uh, but uh, 20, 23,800 new and resale home transactions closed escrow in California during the month of, Mar during the month of March. Almost 24,000 sales. Not bad until you look at this. The home sales volume experience is volume, number of sales, not price, but number of sales. It went up a little bit from the prior month, but it's still down 33% from a year ago. So the number of sales is still down by 33%. That's, that's a lot. Uh, the year to date, is actually 35% before a year ago, which is horrible. Annual home sales in 1922 experience, 1922, annual home sales in 2022, I'm only off by a century, annual home sales in 2022 experienced a 24% decrease from 2021, but more critically, sales volume in 2022 was 12% below the 2019 rate, which is the last year we had a typical cycle. So 2019, very normal real estate cycle, pretty good. 2020, we get hit with the pandemic and all the craziness that goes with that. Prices start going up because interest rates are so artificially low through the pandemic. 2022, not as good as 21, but still pretty good. Houses still going up a little bit. And now we are going off the cliff. So anyway, during 2021, historic low interest rates uh, and a buyer fear of missing out, FOMO, which should never govern you buying a house. It's too large a, uh, too large a purchase to get all FOMO'd out. But it happens. But it escalated the housing market and sales activity, cannibalizing future sales while inflating prices. So a lot of buyers who would be coming into the market now as either first-time buyers or move-up buyers wisely got into the market when interest rates were very, very low to take advantage of those, and there just aren't as many of those out there. There are still people out there who are buying, we're still selling houses, but not at the rate we were a year ago, and that's all because of the interest rate. So here's what's going to happen. Sales volume will experience a slight upturn during the spring and summer of 2020, 2023, so we're going to go up a little bit this year, nice little bubble, but the causes and everything that, ca that have put us in this position, position are causing sales to rise on a little bit monthly basis, but not year over year. And this is the big one. 2023 will be a year of weakening for the California home sales uh, volume. In other words, we're not selling as many houses this year. Uh, today's supply of homeowners was exhausted during a pandemic buying spree. We had too many people come out during the pandemic and buy houses. The market, I should say, had too many. Uh, good for those of you who bought houses because you're ahead of the curve now, especially with a nice low interest rate. But it, believe it or not, damaged the uh, market. Home sales volume will continue to trail. Will continue to trail off in 2023 and 2024. Sales volume will depend on how steeply prices drop in 2023. Without the support of a steady rush of home sales, home prices are plummeting from their April 2022 peak, causing recent mortgage home buyers to slip underwater. 
that's what we're also seeing now is a lot more people are underwater. Expect a, re expect a return of real estate speculators in 2024 to provide a dead cat bounce during the ongoing sales slump. Anybody else out there know what a dead cat bounce is? Have you ever heard this before, Andrew? You like dead cat? I love it. It's an economic term that I love. It's kind of my new favorite. I'm using it now. I'll tell everybody what it is because I just love this term. A dead cat bounce is a brief recovery in the price of a declining commodity. In other words, um, if you look at uh, a bank, for example, like First Republic, First Republic stock, stock is dropping, and they may be out of business here by the end of next month. I hope that's not true. I like First Republic, but First Republic stock dropped like a rock, and then all of a sudden it bounced back up a little bit, and now it's dropping again. The idea is the idea is derived from the, from the idea that it, even a dead cat will bounce if it falls from a high enough height. So that's what it means. A dead cat bounce is a dead cat will bounce if you drop from a high enough height. Uh, in other words, it's nothing that does you a whole lot of good as far as the economics is concerned of the market, but it does create a little artificial bounce. And that's what we're in now. We are very much, the real estate market is in what can very well be described as a dead cat bounce. We're going to see stronger numbers. Uh, when the April numbers come out, we're going to find they're a little bit stronger. And the March numbers uh, are going to be even stronger than that. And then they're going to start to tail off a little bit. We're in a little bit of a bounce in the market because the interest rate, the Fed raised the interest rate uh, last month, if we all recall, early this month. And uh, the mortgage market did not follow suit because while there is a correlation, there isn't necessarily a direct correlation. And it has to do with the stock market and how that works. We talked a little about that last week, so I won't belabor it. But uh, whenever the stock market uh, uh, goes a little nutty and people run into the bond market, what that does is it keeps interest rates low, which is good for home buyers. Very, very good. That's not going to happen this next time. Now, I will tell you, next week there's a meeting of the Fed. I believe it's on the 3rd. And they're going to raise the interest rate again. The Fed is going to raise the interest rate. I'm convinced of this. If they don't, I will shave my beard. I like my beard. I'm not in any danger of shaving it off. Trust me, the Fed is going to raise the rate again. And the market is not going to react the way it did last time because there are no bank failures on the, on the, on the horizon, it would appear, which is good. But without panic in the... In the stock market, that means money's not going to run to the bond market, it's going to stay in the stock market, and what that means is interest rates are going to go higher. So, that's what I've been saying for the last couple of weeks. If you have a house to sell, think about doing it sooner rather than later. If you're going to wait two or three years, that's fine, but if you're going to do it, do it now. If you have a house to buy, same thing. The interest rate is going to be higher a month from now than it is now. In some places, you get good enough credit, the interest rates actually, you can actually get a 30-year fix at under 6.5% now. We have one client right now is getting 6.125, which is great. Uh, that's not going to be available 30 days from now. So if you're you're looking, get off the stick, let's get going, get into the game, because waters are going to get choppier as they, as they go ahead. It doesn't mean we can't weather them. It doesn't mean you can't get through them. It just means it's what we're going to have to get into, because... The longer you take to get into that decision, as the market weakens, you'll get a little bit better price on a house uh, in about another three to six months. But the interest rate you're going to be paying is going to be much, much higher. And the interest rate always prices you out more than the house does unless you're a cash buyer. So we're missing the investor component of the market right now. The first-time buyer the component of the market is way down. The, the move-up buyer component of the market is what's been hit the most. There's not a lot of move-up buyers out there, unfortunately, not, not historically. And it's causing a problem, and it's one problem after another, and it's only going to get worse. And if I hear one more pundit tell me how a recession is possible when we are darn sure in the middle of one as we speak, you know, a recession is defined by a drop in, in, uh, dur in uh, durable goods and expensive things. Housing is down 10%. It's down 10%. That is an indication of a recession. Car prices are not what they once were. Car prices are going to come down a little bit. It's easier to get a deal on a car right now. Again, sign of a recession. Milk, eggs, everything else, way through the roof as inflation is going crazy. Again, a recession. So for those who are saying that a recession might happen, let me just flip all the cards over now and tell you we are already in one. At least real estate-wise, we are absolutely in a recession. There are still good things to happen because we have this little dead cat bounce we're in, and that's going to last for about 60 to 90 days, and then we're back to hard times again. So summer will be okay, spring will be okay, but after that, it's, it's going to get a little nasty. I mean, in the middle of the summer here, we're going to have problems with pricing, that's for sure, because uh, houses are going to start to return, inventories will start to return, and when they do, houses are, uh, uh, with lower housing prices... We're going to have a problematic market. Uh, I don't think we're looking at the same kind of mess that we had in 2008, 9, and 10, but it is not going to be good. And with some of the government rules that we're looking at now, it's going to get a lot worse. So I tell you what, before we bring Jane on for our next segment, let's tee that up a little bit. Because one of the things we're going to talk about, because I've been studying this for the last, well, really the entire month of April since I first got a hold of it. Uh, the White House has a plan. And God bless the White House for their plans. I, I love a good White House plan, regardless of who's, uh, who's in the office. Uh, the White House has a plan to nationalize housing policy, and the idea is to grant renters more protection. And 
I can't even begin to tell you how wrong-headed I find this. I'm a landlord. I represent a lot of landlords. I represent a lot of tenants, too. I, I get both sides of this, this deal. What I'm telling you is what's coming out of the White House, first of all, is strictly aspirational, not operational, so it's kind of a waste of time. I mean, it's like saying, we shall join hands and sing kumbaya. Yeah, we should do that. That'd be great. How? I'll give you an example. Uh, they're putting together what they're calling a blueprint for a renter's bill of rights, and it lays out five principles that the president hopes will shape future policymaking at all levels of the government. Sounds pretty good, I guess, depending on what he's asking for. So here are the five things they want to concentrate on in the White House's national plan for a, a renter's bill of rights. Number one, access to safe and affordable housing. Well, okay, we should all have access to safe and affordable housing. I wouldn't argue that point. Number two, clear and fair leases. Okay, sure. Uh, everyone should understand what they're signing when they're signing it. We're going to talk about leases a lot later in later the show today. Uh, education, enforcement, and enhancement of rights. Well, I don't know about education or enforcement, or enhancement of rights. I mean, renters aren't really lacking rights in most places. Um, they don't typically know how a lot of their rights are, work, so education is good. Um, and enforcement is really not up to the landlord or the, the, the tenant, so I'm not sure how a Bill of Rights helps that. That's really up to the, the um, uh, government in the area that you're, you've got your house in. But, okay, education, enforcement, and enhancement of rights. Number four, the right to organize. I don't think any tenants don't have the right to organize, so I'm not entirely clear what they're after there. Uh, and number five... Eviction prevention, diversion, and relief. Now, number five is the big one. Because I'm all for eviction prevention, I'm all for diversion, and I'm all for relief. However, when you, you when the government steps in and protects one segment of the economy at the expense of other segments of the economy, it causes a disaster. In this case, a recession. What is going on with government rules and renters right now, and landlords right now, I don't know how else to put it, but in our area here in Southern California... I, it's almost, if you'd seen it in a movie, you wouldn't believe it. If you'd, if you'd seen these rules in a movie, what you would think is, oh, this, this screenwriter doesn't know what he's doing. That's, I can't believe that. It's ridiculous. Uh, we're going to talk about that. That's why I brought Jane on, uh, bringing Jane on today to talk about some of this stuff because landlords all over this country are frustrated because every time they turn around, the rules are changing. And in Southern California, we've got it particularly bad. In L.A. County, L.A. City, we've got it particularly bad. We're a little bit better in Santa Cruz, thank goodness. But uh, the rules are just absolutely insane. And I want to go over a couple numbers just so you understand when we get into this, kind of how important this is. Over 20 million of the 50 million rental units in the United States are owned by what the government refers to as mom-and-pop landlords. Uh, I, I prefer to call them as individual investor landlords, but mom-and-pop landlords. What that means is they only own one to two other properties aside from the one they live in. And that is... A big chunk of the more of the rental market. It's a very, very big chunk of the rental market. Uh, again, for, in California, 44% of every household in California is a renter. That's why rentals are such a big deal in this part of the world. Uh, there are 17 million renters in the United States. 13. Point, uh, sorry, 13.6% of all rentals in the United States are in California. So as California goes, so goes the country. So what we do in this state, in our, in our various cities and towns, counties and states, regarding how rentals are handled and the laws that govern landlord-tenant relationships, um, the rest of the country doesn't necessarily have to follow, but it just does because of volume. So it is completely ridiculous. Uh, and again, the key word is affordability, like we were talking about last week. Affordability, affordability. Uh, and here's the big number. Rents have, have, uh, have risen 26% nationally in 2021 and even more in 2022. So rents are up ridiculously. Um, many, And unfortunately, most of these houses, or a good portion of these houses, are these, quote, mom and pop landlords. They do not have millions of dollars. So if they don't get the rent, they're not paying the mortgage. If they're not paying the mortgage, house is in danger of foreclosure. I've had client after client after client. We have had to sell a property that they would otherwise keep because they had one rental property and they're supposed to fund their retirement because the, the tenant stopped paying, the landlord could not get relief, couldn't get the tenant out, and the tenant sat there you know, twiddling their thumbs while the house headed to foreclosure. It, it has been just a ridiculous problem, and the way this is being handled is, well, frankly, as a, as a citizen of this part of the world, embarrassing. It really is just dumb. But, um, you know, the, the, the amount of renters in this country is going up steadily. I try to change that because we need more, more we need more owners, but we're going to talk about that a little bit when Jane gets in. We're going to have her come in and we're going to talk about the ridiculous rules about you can't evict people, you can't get, even at the end of a lease, it's, it's completely nuts. So we're going to have Jane and we're going to talk about all that good stuff when we come back from commercial, but uh, why don't we take a break, we'll listen to some commercial, I always like to say pay some bills. I'm Rich Sherman, this is The Real Estate Fix with Rich Sherman on your hometown station, KHTS 98.1, and when we're back we'll have Jane, who's the brains of the operation, talking about uh, what landlords can and cannot do and how to protect yourself, and more importantly, 
where to buy a rental property right now because some places are better than others. So as soon as commercials over, we'll have Jane in and we'll talk about all things landlord and tenant. I'm Rich. You're listening to The Real Estate Fix with Rich Sherman. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome back. back. I'm Rich Sherman, your host of The Real Estate Fix with Rich here on KHTS 98.1 AM. I'm sorry, 98.1 FM. I know the difference. 98.1 FM and AM 1220. Uh, also at hometownstation.com. And uh, for those of you who asked, uh, you're, you're welcome. I brought Jane in because Jane is, as I say all the time, the brains of the outfit here. Smarter and better looking than I am. Uh, but my wife, Jane Sherman, is in here, real estate uh, attorney extraordinaire. And she's going to talk to us today about all sorts of things that we see going on with landlord tenant stuff because the government regulations that we're seeing now in, uh, well, first of all, the state of California, the county of Los Angeles, and the city of Los Angeles, which luckily we're north of, as you all know, we're outside of the city of LA. We do still follow our county rules. Uh, is just insane, and we've had one problem after another, and I don't think most people, unless you're an attorney, know what the laws are right now, because they are changing, and they just changed to set laws this month, right? Yeah, some of them in L.A. City uh, took effect April 1st, and then others uh, the end of March. Completely ridiculous. We're going to get into all this, so those of you who are welcome, Jane, thank you for coming in. It's always nice. Hi. We share a car on the way here. It's always good. Uh, but we're going to talk about some of this stuff, because our goal here is to educate, and what is going on, uh, if you're a landlord, uh, or if you're a tenant on both sides of the equation, or if you're an investor looking to buy rental property, is completely and utterly ridiculous. I don't know how else to explain it. It's like something out of some sort of weird Baroque comedy. I, I really don't get it. Uh, so, Jane, why don't you get us up to speed on some of the some of the current laws? Because as it stands right now, and I want to make sure, because I wrote this down, I want to forget it. As it stands right now, basically, if you, are in, if you own a house, you can't raise the rent, regardless of the market rate, without doing all sorts of special things and giving the tenant all sorts of incentives. You can't get a tenant out of a house, even if they're at the end of the release, to sell your house. And if that wasn't crazy enough, you can't even move back into your own house because you had it as a rental property. You can't even evict a tenant at the end of a lease to move back into your own house without going through all sorts of stuff. Basically, if you're a landlord these days, in order to do kind of anything, you have to hire an attorney. Which, yeah. if you're, I guess it's great for the legal profession, but not so great for landlords. So, uh, educate us a little bit. Tell us a little bit about about, uh, about some of this stuff. Like, why can't a landlord, at the end of, at the end of a lease, if I have a contract with a tenant, and the contract says you're going to pay X amount per month, and you're going to say, let's say it's a one year lease, so at 12 months you're going to do it. At the end of the lease, contract is fulfilled. We go our separate ways. But you're looking at me like, no, not anymore. No, no. It used to be that way. It used to be in California. You could, um, at the end of a, tenant, a tenancy, um, you could evict a tenant uh, for no reason at all um, if they were not under a, a fixed-term lease. Um, but starting a couple of years ago, unfortunately, um, starting, well, Los Angeles has always had some uh, regulations going on, but it went statewide in 2020, uh, January 1st, actually, where the state started what they're calling rent stabilization ordinances. Um, and the intent is to obviously stabilize the rent for the properties, but they're also after stabilizing the tenancy as a whole. They are trying to keep people in the properties um, and not have them evicted. So there, there is this layer on top now where, um, and the new laws are, they're split into two categories, really. There's rent stabilization affecting the amount of rent, and that ties into what you're talking about at first, where there are limits on what you can um, charge to increase the rent. But there are also, um, uh, and there are a lot of exceptions to that. So the good part of it is a lot of single-family homes and um, individually owned properties and condos are exempt from the restrictions on raising the rent, However, the other part of these laws are what's called just cause ordinances. And that is the part that prevents a landlord from evicting a tenant from their own property, who is month to month even, without just cause. And those just causes are defined very narrowly. Well, I'm all, I'm all for stabilization. I'm all for keeping people in property. But it seems to me, if we have an agreement, and you live up to your end of your agreement, and I live up to my end of the agreement, the agreement's over, the agreement's over. It is not the individual landlord's job to guarantee housing for the tenant beyond their lease. However, the state of California, the county of Los Angeles, and the city of L.A. seems to feel differently about this. They seem to think uh, that when you rent a property to somebody, that may just be a lifetime thing. That just you may have no choice. You may just be stuck being their landlord whether you want to be or not. And that, is, that seems crazy to me. Again, I'm all for stabilization, but it is not the individual landlord's job 
to do what the state needs to be doing. If the state has a homelessness problem, and they do, and if the city has a homelessness problem, and they do, it is government's responsibility to fix that. It is not the landlord's responsibility to fix that. But yet, here we are. Yeah, that's that's a good theory, but the government has made it the uh, landlord's job in many cases to... Um, to maintain the tenancy there. And, and in some cases, it's really quite egregious. If you've got a tenant in there and paying rent um, and everything's going along fine, you may not even have any problems. But um, I had uh, one client with a um, property they had inherited from their uh, parents who passed away and moved into the property and they were, uh, sorry, inherited the property. And when they went to look at the situation with the tenant, they found out the tenant was the rent had not been raised in twenty years. Wow, I want that. Um, and it was about a third of what market rent should be. Oh. Um, and so they, they wanted, wanted to raise it. Well, the tenant probably liked that job. Probably not, not the raising part. But they probably liked having the same rent for twenty years in Los Angeles. Yeah, and, and that's part of it for me. Uh, you know, I get that a, a certain a large percentage increase is difficult to handle, but um, you're ignoring the fact that this person had that property at a much below rental price for many years. So there was that advantage, and that, that was more stable than it should have been. I'm also sure over 20 years, they put money into the property, they fixed this, they fixed that, they fixed the other thing. Because I find, I mean, I love, I love tenants, and our, I love our tenants. And if our tenants are listening out there, and somewhere, I thank you guys, I appreciate you all. But it is amazing to me that if, say, a water heater or a stove dies, it is suddenly your stove, landlord, you need to fix your stove. But if it's a rent issue or a tenancy issue, it's my house. I mean, I know for the tenants, you know, feeling possession is where they live, that's fine. But it's not your house. If you want to own a house, go buy one. Call me, I'll help you do it. It's not that hard. But if you're a tenant, you have to accept at face value, you do not own the property. And the state's, the state's actions now seem to be putting people in a position, tenants in a position, where they have the same rights, in fact, some, in some cases, more rights than the owners do. You as a tenant, and we've seen this happen in the office, could force a landlord, could force your landlord into foreclosure, and the tenant walks away and scathed, the landlord loses their house. Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of these laws really, um, you know, going back, you know, 10 or 15 years ago before these laws took effect, I would get a lot of questions from people and say, you know, I could really, I don't think I could ever be a landlord because, you know, everybody's heard the story about a tenant staying in a property for two years without paying rent and destroying it. You know, and I would say, no, it's, you know, it's, I granted the laws in California are fairly tenant oriented. However, if you stay on top of things and if possible, have a manager if it's in the budget, but you, you stay on top of notices and you don't let things go, um, you can, that can be handled, you know, pretty reasonably. You don't have to get an attorney involved. You could just, um, you know, be a reasonably smart person and handle that. But honestly, now, um, because the problem is the state law was 2020, there are new laws this month and in the last year or two in the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles, which covers any property that's in the unincorporated area of L.A. County. So if you, so that's why L.A. City, you're under one ordinance. If you're in the unincorporated areas of Los Angeles County, not in one of the other cities, um, you have a separate set of laws, and then there's the state of California, um, that undercuts everything, and they have different rules. For example, the um, most of them, like I said, single-family residences are exempt from the rent restrictions, um, but part of, uh, of the qualification and the exemption is the age of the property. In the state of California, the property uh, properties built in the last 15 years are exempt. Um, they want to make things fair to the developers for newer properries. Oh, yes. Got to be fair to the developers. People with lots of money in this argument are the ones we need to be fair to. Not the individual landlords who are losing their retirement in their houses, but developers should get a break on this law. Sounds well, good. They had the lobbyists. I think they did. Yeah, yeah I don't think there's a lobbyist for individual land, uh, landlords, but go on. But meanwhile, the county, um, the county of Los Angeles, so that would be the unincorporated areas, which... In our little area here, that includes Castaic, Acton, Agua Dulce, everything outside the city, right? Um, they're considered exempt if the properties were built after February of 1995. So that's a different timetable completely. Well, house in March of 95. Um, yeah, well, February, I think it was February 1st. So, yeah, there are going to be a few people who are unhappy about that. Let's talk about that, that one client. So the client, they inherit a house. 
The tenant has been paying an extraordinarily low rent, and that's fine. It worked for him. But now, obviously no lease. Lease is up. Contract is, is, has been long ago concluded by all parties. But yet they cannot really raise the rent or get the tenant out to sell the property, even though it's an inherited property. Some pro- I have a, one client where they couldn't raise the rent um, because it was a duplex um, because the, again, the single family homes are often really generally going to be exempt from a restriction on the rent increase. So, and, but, it's a, but this is where it's, it's really important to know what the rules are and the fact that they change. So you constantly have to be checking to see what the current rules are, which is why I think you have to get an attorney involved at this point. Because um, one uh, set of clients came to me, they inherited a property, they wanted to sell it, very much like you were talking about. They recognized that this is a good time to sell the property. They kept them. Um, yeah, so they want to sell it, but they can't. Because they cannot evict the, ten- the tenants are month to month. They have been there for, I think, 15 years. Um, and they can't evict the tenant in order to sell the property. And selling the property with a tenant far below market value is never going to happen. Yeah, well, if, if you're looking, I'll just, I'll just step in as the realtor. If you're looking to sell a property and you've got a tenant in place, if that tenant is paying market value rent, you can find yourself a buyer at market value. If they're not, yeah. then you're not getting market value for the property. Because the, the new buyer is going to come in and be in the, in the same shoes and not be able to evict the tenant. Now, one of those properties, one of the clients that I've dealt with, the good news was that they are um, they're not subject to the rent control, but they are subject to the just cause. So they can't evict them, but they can raise the rent to full market value. Where were the examples? Just where the house was? That figure um, the house single family home owned by an individual. Mm-hmm. Um, so like I said, in most of these cases, county, state, and even city, um, depending on the type of property, uh, it's going to vary a little bit, but almost all of them, single family residents or condo, um, anything that's a single family unit is going to be exempt from the restrictions on the rent. So that part's good. So, well, some, some of the restrictions, restrictions on the rent. Uh, yeah, yeah, some, some of the restrictions. restrictions. But, but, but again, they, the just cause um, applies. So in this case, they couldn't evict the tenant, but they can raise the rent. But they didn't know this, so they had already served the tenant with a 60-day notice to quit. Okay. To leave the property. Okay. Um, and it was only when they just wanted to sort of double check that they were doing things right, came to me and said, you know, just in case we have trouble with the tenant not moving, we wanted you to look at this. And I had to tell them, first of all, they can't evict the tenant in order to sell the property. They um, can raise the rent to market value. As determined by who? Well... That has yet to be tested, I think. Well, I new think, laws hasn't been tested. Right, that's the right. other problem. problem. These are, you know, this is these have been new laws during the pandemic, so they have not been tested. We don't have guidance from the courts or from uh, the county and all that. So in this case, they have to. They could. They could. They could raise. They can evict, but they can raise the rent to fair market value, which in all likelihood is going to mean that the tenant is going to need to move. So that can accomplish the same thing. I, 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 I don't, what I don't understand is, why if I am a landlord, and there are a lot of people out there who are listening to landlords, tenants as well, but if I'm a landlord, why do I have to show just cause to do what I can legally do with my property? That is nuts. You're a tenant, we have fulfilled our arrangement, good deal, bad deal, whatever, our, our contract is done. Because that's what the law is now. That, that's how it is now. And on top of that, so they can, so they can't evict them directly in order to sell. They can at least, since it's their investment, they can raise the rent to market value. If the tenant, the, but, and this, this goes back to actually pre-existing California state law, that if you are raising the rent more than 10% in a 12-month period, you first have to give them 90 days notice, so you have to give them more notice, which I got at least I kind of understand a little bit more. Um, but if they decide to move because they can't afford the rent, market value rent. Wait, let me guess. The landlord has to pay them. Yes, this is a big part of the problem with these um, the landlord tenant laws now is relocation assistance because for all of these single family homes and condos that aren't um, that it, the rent control doesn't apply to the just cause does apply to which means you have to have a very good reason and basically the only decent reason is that the landlord is moving into the property um, and there are some government rules if you've got a notice from the government to 
you know, it's a red tag or, you know, there are other government actions. But that's the most common is going to be the landlord wants to move in. But even under those circumstances, if, if a tenant moves for something that is not their fault, they didn't pay the rent or they breached the lease, you have to pay them relocation funds. You have to pay them money. And in some cases, um, as a single family residence, it's one month rent. And in other cases, like in the county of LA, it's not limited on single family homes, it's based on bedrooms. So, so it's, it's going to be somewhere between nine and twenty thousand dollars, I believe. So let me see if I get this straight. If I have a five bedroom house in Los Angeles City, and I have a tenant who cannot afford to have me raise the rent, so I want to move them out and sell my house, I have to pay them up to twenty thousand dollars to get them out of my house, which our lease is done. I'm not saying if it's a lease, you want a lease. But yeah. Our contract is complete. I keep saying that because this is the part that, that flummoxes me the most. Yeah. Uh, our, our deal, deal is, is done. done. What, what I offered you, what you offered me, we've all agreed. We're all fine on both sides of that. that. But now, if I am allowed to raise the rent because the market will dictate that, uh, and, and the tenant can't afford it, I could have to pay the tenant up to $20,000 to move out of my home so that I can then sell it? Yes. So the tenant is now well, my business partner? No, actually, you can't evict them to sell it. You can evict them to move in. And don't think about moving in for six months or a year and moving out because there are look-back provisions. Uh, like, like up, up to, to five, five years, years and I think longer that it'll allow them to move back, back in. in. So, so is this the real estate, if the investment part of the real estate market hadn't been damaged enough by high interest rates and low consumer confidence, confidence and the recession we're in the middle of, the government thought they'd exacerbate that a little bit by making it all but impossible to let people, to get people out of houses moving on to other things. Uh, I do not get why the government thinks it is the individual landlord's responsibility to take care of housing. If the government wants to get into government housing, then they have the billions of dollars to do so. Individual landlords do not. And treating individual landlords the same way you would treat, like there's a huge, there's a huge company in California, they have over 1,100 doors. I understand treating them differently. They're a multi-billion dollar corporation. Individual landlords are not. That, that is completely, completely and totally ridiculous. ridiculous. But, but I want to talk some more about this guy. I have questions. I have questions. I have questions. I sound smart because I'm married to her, but I have questions. So we're going to have to talk about that. We're going to keep Jane for another second. Stand for another second? Sure. Good, because you left the door. I can't leave anyway. We're going to have another second with Jane. We're going to talk some more about this because this is just flabbergasting to me. I cannot understand this craziness, and I want to, and I'm sure you guys do too. So we're going to take another break. We're going to hear some more wonderful advertising, pay a few bills, which we always like to do around here. Uh, my, uh, my name is Rich Sherman. This is Jane Sherman. This is The Real Estate Fix with me, Rich, on KHTS 98.1 FM, AM 1220, our hometown station. And when we get back, more questions for, for Jane about the law and landlords and tenants. Thank you guys for listening. We'll see you at the end of the break. Hello, welcome, welcome back, back to The Real Estate, Estate Fix with Rich on KHTS 98.1 FM and AM 1220, your hometown station. We're talking today with my, my favorite real estate attorney, and in my opinion, the best real estate attorney. Uh, I'm probably colored by that opinion by a little bit that she's married to me and has my same last name. But, but uh, so that's, that's probably, probably why. why. So we have so Jane, Jane in with us, Jane Sherman, real estate uh, uh, attorney extraordinaire. Uh, we're, uh, we're talking about landlord tenant rules, rules because what we've, we've seen in the state, in the state of California, California, the county of Los, Los Angeles, and particularly the city of Los Angeles, is absolutely insane. It would, it would seem that the state and the, and the, and the government, government entities are on this weird crusade, crusade as their way, way to fix homelessness is to force landlords to shoulder this issue. issue. And, and that's, that's completely insane, insane because, because most landlords, landlords don't have the money or the wherewithal to service, service this issue. That's, that's what we have government, government for. Uh, uh, one, one of the many reasons, reasons we all pay taxes, taxes not to mention our property taxes. taxes. So, so we're, we're talking about this ridiculous restrictions. So, so if you're a landlord and you have uh, you reached the end of the lease and you wish to raise the rent, you may have to pay the tenant to raise the rent. If you're a landlord and you want to move a tenant out at the end of the lease to sell a house, you may not, not be able, able to, or you may have to pay them an exorbitant amount of money, amount of money to move out of your house so you can sell it. And then and my favorite, if you want to move back into a house, it's your house. If you want to move into it and you have a tenant in it, again, whose lease is up, this is not for people whose leases are in place. We're not messing with leases or contracts, that's fine. But their lease is up, you may have to pay them to move out of your house so that you can move back into your own home. Do I, did, did I miss anything? Did I got all that right? Uh, no, no, I, I think, think that's, that's um, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's very, very challenging, challenging right now. I mean, the, the problem, problem is um, all of the laws, most, most of them are fairly new, new uh, some, some very new. new. So, so there, there, there isn't, isn't a lot of guidance, guidance out there, there even with me looking online to make sure I had the most updated information. It was not clear. There are handouts, I will say, get the information you can from the city and the county. 
Um, but, but I had, I had to, go to go read, read the ordinances and, and try to make sense, sense of that, that, which is so much fun. fun. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dork, dork and I, I like reading law cases and researching, but that, that was even a little, little much for me. me. Um, so, so I think it's just important if you are currently a landlord or you want to buy rental property, you just have to know that you need to get all the information right up front. You have to you have to take the right approach. Like, for example, these clients who... They had, they had already, already given, given a, a notice, notice to vacate, vacate to tenants who they, they couldn't, couldn't vacate, vacate the property. If they, if they hadn't, hadn't talked, talked to me or talked to somebody else and had simply waited, waited that time out and, and then, God forbid, filed, filed a case with, a, with, with an attorney that didn't yet know about those rules. Which is most of the attorneys. And then and took three or four, four months to get to court. court. And, and then, then found out they had to go back and start over and give a 90-day notice to raise the rent. I mean, I mean, we're, we're talking, talking about, about a year, year from now before, before you can legitimately, legitimately do anything, anything with your property. property. And, and as, as you pointed, pointed out, a lot of people, if, they're, if they, they want to sell in the next few years, they, they should, should sell, sell sooner rather than later. later. So, so that's, that's what these clients are trying to do. But they, yeah, there's a lot of restrictions there. So even though they inherited the property, we're in the middle of what I'm going to keep using this phrase until I get tired of it. Because we're in the middle of a dead cat. I just love that. I love that there's an economic, well, we have cat. I love sometimes I'd like to kill it. I love that, not all, but sometimes. I love that, that there's an economic term called dead cat bounce, where markets respond a little bit, whether they bounce up a little bit just before they die, because the theory is even a dead cat will bounce and drop from a high enough height. Don't go testing that. I think it's funny. It's not. It's just. Don't, it's a cartoon. Don't, don't actually do that. We like cat. Uh, love them in most cases. But, uh, yeah, we're in the middle of this dead cat bounce that they can't take advantage of because of these ridiculous rules. I'm sure they're not alone. They're an exemplar of lots of people. No, they're really just an example. There are a lot of people in the same position. And, and also, I don't think we've really touched on this very much. Um, the California law and at least the city law, I'd have to double check on the county, both require that there be very specific paragraph of notice citing laws in the, in the original, original lease or provided, provided to the tenants, tenants before you can proceed with an eviction either. either. So, so assuming everything is good, well, two things. First of all, the notice has to be there. And in the city and the county, you must register your rental property with the city or the county. And if you give the tenants any notice, you have to provide that notice to the county or city. Um, um, I think, I think in, in, for, for the city, city it's three day, within three days of the notice being given, given and, and I think the county is five days. Um, but, but also, if you, you don't do that and you get to the end, end you get to go back and start over. over. I, 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 this it just feels, feels like a game of shoots and ladders, ladders where you, you, you go, go up a little ways, ways and then you, you get an obstacle and then you slide right back down. So I just it's getting the information right up front and knowing that you're following the right path is important. Shoots and ladders has rules I can understand. Uh, to, all, to all deference to, to, to our listeners, I, I listen to you a lot, so I think I follow along better than most. I have no idea what the hell that just was. Yeah. I, I don't doubt that you're correct. I don't doubt that at all. But the translation here is if you have rental property, you need an attorney. Unfortunately, yes. That should, I mean, I don't, again, I don't mind because you're an attorney and I like needing you. That's lovely. But uh, I don't think that's the way it should be. I don't think I want to be a landlord, ergo, I have to have a attorney on retainer. No, it shouldn't be. I mean, that, that's just no ground out of our lawmakers or our former attorneys. Maybe that's why. Maybe they're trying to create a whole new cottage industry. Maybe we can take advantage of a year attorney. Full employment for attorneys. That sounds fantastic. Not needed, but it sounds fantastic. Uh, well, well, again, it sounds fantastic, fantastic for us because you're an attorney. attorney. And I can mm-hmm. say they would do nothing and you can work with them. No? no? She's no. shaking her head vigorously now at me just so anyone who's listening. So, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no it's, 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 it's crazy out there. I don't get it. So, so if you are a landlord, and, and keep in mind, a solid 25 to 30 percent of any real estate market in this country is made up of investors, depending on what the market's doing. 25 to 30 percent. You are now taking that, that 25 to 30 percent of the market and saying, no. We're going to make it way more difficult for you to do business. We're going to make it way more difficult for you to exist. We're going to incentivize you not, not to put, put your money into rental housing and thus create more rentals, rentals. We're, we're going to incentivize you to put it someplace else. So, so the, the state, state, the city, and the county have come up with this wonderful plan to stabilize housing that denies new rental properties from the market except for large corporations and developers who have the kind of money and who have legal staff to get into this. But what they are doing is they are absolutely cratering, destroying the market for the individual landlord. And my problem with that is... Uh, AARP, AARP just put, just put out, out a, no, yet another, another these, these doesn't change. They put out a, recently put out another uh, survey that 99% of people in the United States say that they cannot afford to retire without real estate. And for a lot of people, that may not be the house you're in. For a lot of people, that used to be a rental property. 
So, so this is absolutely, absolutely crazy. crazy. I don't I know what, what, they, what they hope to achieve, achieve here, except, except uh, uh, ex further exacerbating a, a bad situation, making a recession in real estate that much, much worse. worse. I'm, I'm sure that's, that's going to affect property values, values at least a little bit. Oh, God, yes. Yeah, 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 so the upshot of all of this is, if you're looking to get into real estate, if you're looking to get into investment property, you can still do it. Give me a call. We'll set you up. We have an attorney on staff who's fantastic. We have another attorney on staff who's a little less fantastic, but a very nice guy. I'm biased, like I said, she's my wife. Uh, uh, but, but we'll, we'll uh, we can we can start in the right direction. And, and goodness, thank goodness, thank goodness for Santa Cruz. Korea. We, we do, do not have a lot of the same restrictions here. We still have plenty. They're not nearly, nearly as bad as in LA City. So you can still exist and you can still be, be a landlord, still do good things here. And it's a little easier to rent despite the ridiculous values. But we'll talk about all this as time goes on. If you guys have questions about any of the stuff we talked about today, please, please, please call me. You can reach me through the station. Call me on my cell phone, 661 714 1400. This has been the Real Estate